Amen, friends. You guys can grab a seat. That song is very timely for what I'm going to be talking to you guys about this morning. So again, Campus Band, thank you guys for leaving us each and every week. As Connor said, my name is Hannah Stobbs. I'm the graduate assistant of women's ministry, which means I get to hang out with girls all the time. Yeah, I love it. It's so fun. But I get to hang out with girls all the time and say, hey, Jesus loves you, you should follow him. And then sometimes they do it and it's really hype, sometimes I don't and I'm like, that's cool too, you know, he loves you though. So I'm really honored to be with you guys this morning and I'm excited to share what I think the Lord has for us. The song even just at the end saying, I'm not enough unless you come, will you meet me here again? And I'm really hoping today to really not say anything groundbreaking. I don't think I'm gonna be like shocking anyone with anything I talk about today. But my goal today is really to remind you, hopefully, of something you already know. So I have a group of girls that come to do discipleship at my house on Sunday nights. Hannah, Briley, Mallory, I don't know if y'all are in here, but hey, hey, they're everywhere, what's poppin'? Yeah, 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 yeah. So these girls come to my house on Sunday nights and I was talking to them a couple weeks ago. I was like, I'm praying about what to talk about in chapel. I really just don't know where I wanna go. What I wanna talk about is pretty simple, but we had just been talking about a podcast that talked about being simple. And so it was either Hannah or Briley. One of the two was like, Hannah, you just told us for like 30 minutes to just keep it really simple, so you probably should just talk about whatever's really, really simple. And I was like, well, golly, you guys are so smart. You know, like, I'll just do whatever you say, you know? So um, anyway, I'd love to pray one more time, and then we're gonna dive into God's word. So God, I'm so, you know my heart better than anyone, and I'm thankful for that. And you know how humbled I am to be up here and to just share truly what you have been teaching me over the last couple weeks. And I just pray in Jesus' name that we would walk away changed And again, not walk away changed because of me, you know that's the last thing I want, but walk away changed because of you and the fact that you're good and you have something for us in this place. So God, I pray that our hearts would be open. I pray that we weren't just singing those words, but that we meant them, that we want you to come and to meet us here this morning. And God, I pray that I'm just a vessel, a broken one that is used to proclaim what you have. So I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this morning, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to talk about love this morning. Get pumped, okay? So a couple of things happen when I say I'm going to talk about love. My hopeless romantics and the people in very serious relationships are like, oh my gosh, I'm so pumped. My cynical people or very single friends are discouraged. They'll be crying afterwards. That's awkward. Um, And then like my somewhere in the middle friends are just like, I don't care about love. It's not that important. Valentine's Day is in a couple months. Why do I care? And so there's different types of love that we experience in our lives. You have like a family love, right? It's like your mom and your dad or your weird uncle. It's like, I love you because I have to, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm related to you, right? Then you have your friendship love, and that's something really cool about North Greenville, the community, the friends that you make, you love these people. And I've experienced that in the last year and a half that I've been here. Man, there's something about North Greenville. I love these people. I didn't know North Greenville existed like two years ago, and now I work here, and I live here, and I'm having the time of my life. Then you have romantic love, where you pick a person to spend some of your time with. Maybe you break up, hope, hope that doesn't happen to you, but, or you get married to them. You know, like it goes one of two ways. You're either breaking up or you're getting married, and then you're choosing to be with them for the rest of your life. But then we also have in God's word a spiritual love, a love that comes from God. And so as any millennial or Gen Z would do, I decided, okay, if I'm going to talk about love, I need my friend's professional opinions if I'm going to talk about this. So Last Monday, I interviewed around like 50 to 100 people in the cafe. Were any of you interviewed by me and I, I ruined your lunch? Do any of these people, okay, like I see like some friends. So I interviewed like 100 people and I asked two questions. So people would be sitting at lunch and I'm like, hi, can I like ask you guys some questions? And everyone says yes because some random chick sits at their table. And then I'm like, I have two questions that are really, really easy. My first question is, what is love? And then my next question is, how do you know someone loves you? And then everyone was like, hey, no, those questions are really difficult. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I'm with my laptop. And I'm like, no, but tell me like what you think. So I have a lot of responses. Like you guys said a lot of really fun stuff. And I typed all of it because I'm a fast typer. Thank you, typing class in 12th grade. Okay, so when I asked what is love, the most common thing was that song. So what is love? Ah, that's good. Okay, okay, okay. That was the most common. And I felt bad because some people thought they were really groundbreaking. So I'm like, what is love? And they're like, baby, don't hurt me. I'm like, you're the 11th person to say that today. You know, like, you're not special, respectfully. So what is love? I had a couple different things. So what is love? First one, baby don't hurt me. I'm like, okay, baby don't hurt me. It's something you have to choose when someone puts you above themselves. Someone said love ain't real. 
I'm sorry for you, okay? Pay attention today, okay? Love ain't real. Someone said more than a feeling, which I thought was fascinating. Knowing that someone is in your corner no matter what, and they're trying to help you be a better person. That's a great answer. Someone said more than just saying it, it's how you feel. Someone said love is loyalty. They're just synonymous. I thought that was fascinating. Another baby don't hurt me, shocker. Um, love is more than a physical attraction. It has to be a mental thing. You can be mad at someone and still love them. Someone said, have you seen the movie Enchanted? And I'm thinking, yeah, that's an incredible movie. You know the song in that? How do you show her you love her? Are we tracking? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. That person was groundbreaking. Let's have a movie night tonight, okay? I love that movie, okay. Um, Someone said natural human emotion for a person, sacrifice and responsibility. This was sweet. They said little things in a relationship. My dad takes out the trash for my mom. That's what love is, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's really tender. Someone take out the trash for me, you know? So um, <laughs> the next one that they said is love is a choice. And so there was a lot of common themes with what love is. But then I said, okay, there's one thing to know what love is, right? But it's another thing to show it. Because how often do I say, oh, this person loves me, but there's no action. And then I'm like, well, maybe they don't. Or people act like they love me, but they've never said it. And so I'm like, how do, you, how do you know someone loves you? And these were even more fascinating. So someone said, by their actions, not their words. Someone who accepts you for who you are. Someone said, you can never truly know if someone loves you. Someone can say it, but you have to have faith. It's kind of like religion. You have faith that someone loves you. Someone said, I don't know, I'm not good at love. Again, I kind of want to pair that person with the love isn't real person and then have a little blind date going. Um, <laughs> So if that was either of you, see me after. Okay, someone said you feel safe with them. Someone said actually doing what they say. We could go on and on. Someone who's willing to set aside their own life to help you along with yours. The person after that said ditto. And I'm like, okay, you're, you're fascinating too. Someone said I could be out with the boys, but I'm spending time with you and that's love. And I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> that's a good answer. Okay, <laughs> now I feel like I'm on Family Feud. Good answer, good answer, you know. Um, <laughs> Someone says, when it's not questionable, it comes naturally, you feel the connection, the action is the proof, and then after that, the proof is in the pudding. So there were a lot of really great examples, and honestly, you guys are so smart. Like, again, we're all in, you guys are in college, you're getting degrees, it's not like you're not smart, and so I loved hearing what you guys had to say, because I'm thinking, if I'm really going to address North Greenville, if I'm going to share about something, I need to know Honestly, like a little vibe check. I need to see what the vibe is about love in here before I share about it all together. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I now know what you guys think. I even know personally what I think what love is and how you know. But if I'm really gonna base my life off something, I need to base my life off the truth of God's word and see what God has to say, right? So if you have your Bibles, indulge me and turn to 1 John chapter four. 1 John chapter four, when you get there, say, Hannah, I'm there. And if you're not there, say, Hannah, hold up. And while you, lots of hold ups, that's what I thought. So, I'm gonna do a little bit of context. Context basically means I'm gonna tell you what the book is about or a little bit about the author before we read it, right? Because that's kind of important. If I'm gonna read words from someone, I need to know what they're talking about. So the book of First John is written by the disciple or the apostle John. That means that's the guy, he was one of the 12 people that followed around Jesus in his earthly ministry. So he got to watch Jesus for three and a half years ministering and doing things and honestly creating and out, like indulge, going in his ministry, if you will. What's fascinating is that John is actually called the disciple whom Jesus loved. I thought that was really interesting. So he, if he knows anything about love or the love of Jesus, it's gonna be this guy. And so in this passage, John is actually trying to correct some theology that's wrong. The people that he's writing to were believing things that weren't true. In the same way, my hope this morning, the similarity, is I'm hoping to remind you or tell you things that maybe you already know, but I'm trying to reframe it to make sure we know and we're thinking correctly, right? So 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 10, is everybody there? I'm there, golly, praise God, thank you so much. She said, I'm there, woohoo, okay. So 1 John 4, 7 through 10 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not, does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. In this, the love of, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So I have three things we're gonna learn about love today, okay? Super simple, three things. How many things? Three. 
Incredible, I worked for a camp, that's pretty obvious. The first one, number one, God is love. That is like point number one if you're taking notes. I challenge you to do that. I take notes every week in chapel, and chapel hits different every week, but that's neither here nor there, that's for free. So the first one, God is love. This is really, really important. The verse does not say love is God, right? Because I think that's what we do in our culture a lot of times. We think that love is the, like, the top thing. If I can get this, I can do this. But it's actually saying God is love. So God is love, God equals love. And what that means is that God is the best example, the best, I'm gonna look at this and I'm gonna try to mimic this. That's what God is to love. But again, the question is, what does love actually mean though? Like we, you guys had some amazing answers of what you think it means. My old pastor of my home church said that love was intellectual surrender with satisfaction. I thought that was really fascinating. Intellectual surrender, like I'm making the choice to surrender what I want, what I think is best, what I need for what is best for you, but there's some satisfaction in that. There's some companionship in that. There's some return for the investment that I've put in. But when I looked at that, I think that's good, but when I came up with my own definition of what love is, I said love is choosing, everyone say choosing, this is important, (laughs) choosing to put someone else's needs above your own because of your deep care for that person. And this is really important, there's lots of layers. So it's choosing to put someone else's needs above your own because of the deep care you have for that person. And there's two parts to that, right? It's I'm putting your needs above mine because I care about you. Because like we've probably seen in our own lives, some people may choose to put my needs above their own, but it's not because they care about me, right? Like a, a simple example, like let's say you go to a restaurant, you go and your waitress is starving. You don't know this, she doesn't tell you. Her name is Sandra, she's really nice. Sandra goes out of her way to bring food to you and fill up your cup and make sure your experience is really, really great. So she cares for you, but she has to. It's not she wants to, she's getting paid, right? In the same way, I may have friends in my life that tell me that they care about me, but there's no evidence of that. And so love has to have both, and ultimately, you have to choose. I'm making the choice to do this. I'm making the choice to love you. So ultimately, God is love means that God continually gives of himself to others and seeks their benefit. God does things to seek our benefit, which makes no sense. What is God gaining in loving me? I'm a broken, messed up person, what does God gain from that? But that's the whole point with love, it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with him, right? It's all choice, I choose to love this person. In the same way sometimes we can choose to love people that don't love us back, or choose to love people that aren't good to us, and it makes no sense, why would I choose to put someone above myself sacrificially out of my care for them if they don't do that in return, but that's what God sometimes does to us, actually not sometimes, all the time all the time. God chooses to love you even when you don't love him back. And so the love is choosing to put someone else's needs above your own out of your deep care for that person. And so I'm using this big whiteboard. I don't know why I'm using it. I honestly just really, really wanted to. Um, That's it. And so um, so I have some definitions up here that are going to help us. So love is choosing to put someone else's needs above your own because of the deep care you have for that person. And you're going to see at the end that all these fun things that are hidden are stacked. So love, God is love is point number one. Now let's go point number two. Everyone say two. Incredible. So, so it's one thing to know what love is, but again, the questions I asked in the calf were what is love and how do you know? So point number two is love always proves itself. Everyone say always. 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 Now say it like you mean it. Say always. always. Beautiful. Love always proves itself. Let's look at verse nine. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Another synonym to the word manifest is proof. So in this, God proved his love for us. Again, love always proves itself. And I can think of ways that people have proven love to me. So an example, right now at North Greenville, my roommate is Nicole Pollard, the lovely and talented. Hey, yo, hi, Nicole, love you so much. Yep, love you, okay? And so one of the ways that Nicole <laughs> proves her love to me, so a backstory that doesn't really matter, I really enjoy singing, okay? I'm not on a worship team, don't put me up here, you know, it's, it wouldn't be good for you, but I love singing. I sing in the house all the time, I play music 95% of the time, and I just sing around the house, which is annoying. Like, if you're thinking, man, that'd be annoying, It is annoying, but I am having a great time. And so Nicole proves her love to me by letting me sing annoyingly in the house consistently without complaining. Nicole, thank you for your selfless love for me. Another example, my best friend Amy, we've been best friends since the fourth grade, so literally like the ultimate, you go all the way back, you knew me since I was 10. I would tell Amy the same stories over and over, but forget that I told them to her, okay? And I'd get really excited to be like, you will not believe what happened, this thing happened, and then this, and then this, and this, I would tell her stories six times and not remember. 
And she would so graciously let me tell her these stories. And finally, she'd be like, Hannah, I'm really sorry. You like already told me that one. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'm sorry. And she's like, this is time number six. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you tell me? And she's like, well, honestly, Hannah, you get so excited when you tell stories. I just want to indulge you and let you keep going. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like really nice. You love me. Ah, okay. And so I'm so thankful for that. Another example, this is like an easy one. I love flowers. The last guy that I dated would send me flowers in the mail. We dated long distance. Mail, like flowers in the mail is very expensive. If anyone's ever looked that up for like any random reason, you're like trying to send them to yourself and be like, get jealous, you know, I don't know who does that. But like, if you look them up, they are so expensive. And I remember one time I like came home from work and on like in the, my old house, there was like a mantle and then a huge, like a huge box, like this big and it was green. And I like came in, I used to work at Chick-fil-A, not bitter, but never again. And then I like come inside and I'm like, who is this box for? And I also love surprises. So it was like a double. And my parents were like, it has your name on it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I like, I didn't run, I just walked in. <laughs> I walked on over and I like opened it up and it is like the most beautiful bouquet of like roses and carnations and flowers, like all my favorite flowers, like all together. And that was proof of the love that he had for me. He told me, Hannah, I love you and here is the proof. But what's cool is we don't just see proof in real life, but we see that with our friends, do we not? Like there's certain things they do, you're like, man, I know they love me because they do this. But the Bible also shows us proofs of people's love or love that has been shown. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses seven through eight, it's the love that God has for the people of Israel. Listen to this, it says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. So God's like, it's not because you were big and bad that I chose you. It's not because you were all that great, for you were the fewest of people. So God kind of hits him with it. It's like, you guys, honestly, there's like none of you. There's like barely any of you. That's not why I picked you. Verse eight. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to his fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. True love is never static or inactive. God reveals his love to mankind in many ways. True love is never inactive or static. It always is showing. But then let's, the Bible continues. So we see Genesis 37, 3. We see the love of a father and a son, the story of Joseph. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because, his son, because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. So the coat of many colors, that was a physical example for Joseph. My dad loves me, look at this coat that I get to wear. We see love from a husband to wife. First Samuel chapter one, it says, but to Hannah, Elkanah, her husband, gave Hannah a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So Hannah can't have kids, but her husband has two wives, her and this other lady, but he loves her. He gives her a double portion, even though she can't have kids. That's pretty selfless. We also see the love of Jacob to Rachel in Genesis. It says, Jacob loved Rachel. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him only a few days out of the love he had for her. So Jacob ends up serving his um, future future father-in-law, Laban, for seven years to marry this girl, Rachel. But then at the end of the seven years, Laban tricks him and is like, actually, my oldest daughter should get married. And it's this girl named Leah. And he's like, oh, okay, well, I'll marry her, but I'd rather still end up with Rachel. So he serves 14 total years for this one girl. That's, like a, that's a lot of work. I don't feel like we see that love today of I'm gonna serve all this time just to be with you. So over and over in our world, we see proof, right? We see proof in God's word. There's proof in both. And so love is always proven. There's always proof. Let's see. The proof of love is in your actions and your words, which makes sense, because it's one thing, right? Someone can be like, oh man, I think you're amazing, I love you, and you're like, okay, and then they don't talk to you ever again. And it's like, well, you clearly don't love me because there's no action and no words. There has to be both, right? And so if this is true, right, love is choosing to put someone else's needs above your own because of the deep care you have for that person, and the proof of love is in your actions in your words, then the greatest proof of love that we've ever seen is the proof of the love of Jesus. Jesus is the proof. Jesus is the proof. And in a lot of ways, that's where I lose the entire crowd. Everyone is like, oh my gosh, wow, a Jesus answer Sunday school. But my hope is that I can actually prove to you that Jesus is the ultimate proof. And when you realize Jesus really is the ultimate example, the ultimate proof, the ultimate, I cannot believe that he loves me, there is no world where you would be able to deny it. There is no world. And so let's look again at 1 John 4, 9 through 10. It says that God sent his son into the world 
so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Again, not that we loved God. Again, we see love is someone choosing, choosing us. So God has chosen us and sets his love on us, not because we loved him, but because he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. And now, then that's also where I lose people where they're like, what is the word propitiation? That's a really big word. Let's all say it together. One, two, three, propitiation. Okay, so like half of you said it. I can tell I'm watching, you know, I got good eyes, I can see in the back. So let's all say propitiation on three. One, two, three, propitiation. Okay, and you're like, I said a word, I don't know what it means, I could have cussed. No, you didn't, don't worry. Okay, propitiation, okay, is something that God does to make it possible for men and women to be forgiven. Propitiation is a sacrifice that bears God ra- God's wrath and turns it to favor. Okay, so it's, hey, God sent his son to be the propitiation. So God sent Jesus to take on all the wrath, all the bad stuff, all the shame, all the sin, and has turned that into accepting that gift, into salvation for all of us. That makes no sense. Why on earth would God choose to put his love on people that are gonna mess up and gonna leave him and gonna make choices and decisions to not follow him? Because he loves us. Love makes us do crazy things. And I know everyone's like, oh, love hasn't, yes, it has. Like, think about it. You can probably think of a time where like, I can't believe I did this, I can't believe I called them, I can't believe I showed up at their house, I can't believe I wrote that level or I wrote poetry. Like, why did I write poetry for this person? You know, like, love makes us do crazy things. It makes us drive through the night. It makes us show up when they've told us over and over, I don't want you, and it's like, yes, you do, because I love you, I want you, you know? Like, it makes us do crazy things, but our God is not a God of accidents, so it seems crazy, but to him it's so logical, and it makes sense because of how much he loves us. It makes, it's mind-blowing to me that someone, again, gosh, friends, I cannot believe someone would love me that much. Like me, I don't deserve a love like this, right? I don't deserve someone to put their love on me because they care. I don't deserve the proof, but God says, actually, yes, you do, and I wanna prove it to you, and to you, and to you, and to each and every one of us. The fact that Jesus was made flesh is evidence of God's grace and love, right? Like the fact that God came to earth. But the fact that he was made sin is the ultimate finale. So it's not just that God came to this earth, right? Because Jesus comes to this earth and lives 33 years and he doesn't sin and doesn't mess up. And that's incredible. But at the end, he takes on our sin and dies. That is like, like I cannot... I cannot fathom it, I cannot wrap my mind around it. The proof of God's love is in the propitiation. That's where the proof is. So earlier in the cast, someone said the proof's in the pudding. No, the proof is in the propitiation. That's where the proof is. The total wiping away of our sin is the proof, and that that proof affects us every day of our lives. Every day of my life is different because of Jesus' death on the cross, every single day. So every day, I get to tap in and remember that incredible love that God has for me. Every single day, I get to live in the freedom in that, in the victory, because the, when someone loves you, it changes the way you act. Yeah. Does it not? It does. We do crazy things, but we also live in, so, in a lot of ways, there's a freedom that comes when someone loves you, right? They picked me. They chose me when they didn't have to. God's love is proclaimed in his word and proven at the cross, and it changes the way that you live. And so I can't talk about love without sharing a Valentine's Day story that I've experienced. I hope you guys don't mind if I share it. Do y'all mind? No, you don't. Okay. So when I was in the ninth grade, I was like low-key talking to this guy at school named Jared. Okay? We love Jared. He's great. Okay, whatever. So J- Jared, ah, you know, a J name. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? Ah, that's what I'm saying. So I was talking to this guy named Jared, okay? And Jared, listen, Jared was great. He was a great guy, and I was so pumped because it was the first Valentine's Day I would have where I was talking to someone, okay? But you guys know how it is in high school. Like, we weren't dating, though. You know, like, it's like we're talking, and if some other girl talked to Jared, it'd be disrespectful because I'm talking to him. Like, like hey, I know he's not my boyfriend, but back up. You know what I'm saying? So, so I'm talking to Jared, and Jared's great. And my friend told me, Hannah, Jared's, like, going to get you something for Valentine's Day. Like, you got to get ready. And I'm like, get ready. I'm like, just bring it on. You know, like, give me something. Yeah. I love presents. So, so I show up to school, and sure enough, during, like, the break, there's, like, two core classes and a break, and then, like, three classes. So during, like, the break, he's like, hey, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. You know, like, saunter on over. Like, hey, like, what do you have for me? And so I, like, go, and he, wrote, he like, made, got me this card. Apparently, it took him all week to pick it out. And I'm like, yeah, dude. You know, it took all week to pick out a card for me. You know, gives me this card and gives me this thing of chocolate. It's, like, really, really sweet. 
And I read it, and at the bottom of the card, it, like, it doesn't write anything. It's just the card, what the card says, and then, love, Jared. <laughs> and, I, I, and I'm like 15, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, love, Jared, wow, you know? And so I, and it's like really great, but here, here is my caveat to my story, as great as my story was, okay? The reason why that Valentine's Day sticks out so much to me is actually not what Jared got me, and it's not actually the card and the chocolates, even though it was all awesome, you know? It's like 15-year-old Hannah was thrilled. But what sticks out to me from that Valentine's Day actually is what I got that morning, okay? So I come, I wake, I wake up, I go to get breakfast and like get ready for school like any other 15-year-old would. And I go and on the counter, my dad had gotten stuff for my mom and for my sister and for me, which is so sweet. And my dad, like, my dad has done that like my whole life. He would always do that. It's very over the top. And it's like, my dad is the best. So I go, and there's a card that has my name on it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. So then like, I walk over and I'm like, Woo, you know, like I'm gonna open this and I open it. My dad has this really beautiful card and he wrote a really cheesy poem that I don't honestly remember a lot of. You went to me, lose some. But here's what I remember from the poem, okay? The last line. So the last line of the poem said, and he knew I was talking to Jared, I was pretty open with my parents. And so the last line said, I know Jared likes you, but I loved you first. <laughs> right in the heart. <laughs> Still gets me, okay? But I know Jared likes you, but I loved you first. And that, that set the rest of the day because it didn't matter what Jared got me. It didn't matter the chocolates or the fact that he took all this time, even though it was really, really great. My dad at home, who had known me my whole life, loved me and proved it every day in the school he sent me to and taking me to school and caring about me and coaching my basketball team. And he proves it today by answering my phone calls and giving me advice and showing that he loves me. And guys, that's what God does for us. Hey, I know your boyfriend likes you. I know sports likes you. I know school likes you. I know your friends like you. I know you're trying to be enough. I know you like that. But I loved you first. I loved you first. Uh, before all those things, before any of your accomplishments, any of your success. Actually, I loved you when you were your filthiest and your dirtiest and your worst, when no one would have picked you. When no one would have picked you. When it was the whole lineup and it's who should I pick and it's dodgeball again and it's who's the last pick. You wouldn't have even been picked then and God says, I want you. Come on. And it's not a, oh, I guess, like, come on. It is, an, it is a ferocious, it is a tenacious. Hey, I want you. Come on. Yep, you right there. Yep, you're mine and I'm yours and I pick you. I pick you. And when someone loves you like that, it changes you. It changes you. And it changes you in like a real way, in a human love way, right? In a relationship with someone. Man, they pick me. That changes how I live. The God of the universe that created everything picks you and loves you and has something for you. And so if love is choosing to put someone else's needs above your own because of the deep care you have for that person, if this is true, and this is true, right? Like we've proven it. If this is true, and if the proof of love is in your actions and your words, if this is true, right? Then the greatest proof of love that we have ever seen is the proof of the cross. This is the greatest proof of love. It cannot be topped. Someone came to this earth didn't screw up, didn't sin, didn't make a mistake, and was thinking of your name. McKenna, Jackson, Andrew, Nicole, whoever you are, he's thinking of you and thought they are worth the choice. They are worth the proof, and I'm gonna die to prove it. And that's huge. And that's huge, and it's not just huge and like, a, oh, that's great. That's huge, and that changes my life. That's something worth living for. This is a love worth living for, are you kidding? Throw my rom-coms in the trash can. This is real love right here. And if this is real love, then my actions are changed. In the same way, Jared liked me and it was awesome and I loved that he cared about me. That changed how I live. But that did not even compare to the long-term love that my dad had, that my dad still has, that my dad still proves. And if that type of love that I can even experience with my earthly father, how much more with the heavenly father? How much more? Nothing says love louder than this, and this love cannot be taken away. That's what's huge. Friends, we date people here and we break up and it's horrible. Breakups are horrible. We talk to people and we don't even have a label on it and then we stop talking and it's horrible. Our friends will do us dirty and it's horrible. Our families will split up and it's horrible. And God says, hey, I love you with a love that cannot be broken and it cannot be tarnished and it cannot be torn no matter what you do. 
no matter what I do, no matter if I today just flew off the deep and did all this crazy stuff, God would still be there and still want me. What type of love is that? What planet am I living on where I deserve that? But God says, you, do, you don't deserve it, but that's kind of the whole point. That's kind of the whole point. I love you and I want you, and you just have to choose. Do you want that or not? And so my question to my friends in this room, John 15, 13 says, the greatest demonstration of love is this, no greater love had man than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. There's no greater love than that, which is so fun, because it's the book of John, so that's the book John wrote before 1 John. And then the greatest demonstration of love is God, is Jesus doing that for us. The greatest, can't be topped. And so my friends, my question in this room, because there's two types of people in this room, right? There are friends in here that are saved and friends in here that aren't. And so my, fr- my friends in here that are saved, you follow Jesus, you have a relationship with Jesus. My question to you is, do you act like this is true? Because if Jesus really loved you, died for your sins, and you've accepted that gift, this changes everything. This changes how I treat the people I work with. It changes how I treat my family. It changes how I treat my friends. It changes how I treat myself. When I look in the mirror, I don't just look at a total screw up. I look at, man, God loves me. God has something for me. Like, I know I've messed up, I know I made mistakes, but man, God loves me, and he's, he's still pushing, he still has something. He wants to speak to me, he speaks to me through his word. Like, do you live like that? That's my question to my saved friends in the room. And then some of you guys in here aren't saved, right? Which means you haven't accepted the gift of salvation. And so my question to you is, how can you deny a love like this? We accept cheap love all the time. I accept the cheap love of, or what do girls say, the bare minimum, you know, like the bare minimum. He texted me one time today, oh my gosh, he loves me. No, he doesn't, okay, he's bored. Okay, (laughs) that's for free, (laughs) okay? (laughs) We accept this cheap love, this bored love, this I'm gonna get something from you love, but you'll note nothing in our definition says that you get anything from it. Nothing in our definition, that's the whole point. And so my question to you, my unsafe friends in the room, when you have a love like that, why would you walk away from it? Why not accept it? Why not accept it? God has something for you. He loves you. God is love. Why not accept it? So what I'd love to do now is I'm going to pray, and I'm going to do two things, okay? So everyone, head bowed, heads are bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to go quick. I know it's 1050. I talk fast. Just two things. First thing, if you're in the room and you're like, Hannah, I'm saved. I love Jesus. I'm following him, but I forget that he loves me like that. And will you just pray that I will be reminded of that love today? And friend, encouragement, if today wasn't a reminder, I hope that you chew on it all day. So if you're like, honestly, Hannah, I know God loves me, but it's never something I really let him like, I don't like really believe it, but I want to. Would you just raise your hand and be like, yo, Hannah, I need someone praying for me. Will you just pray for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are hands everywhere. If you're thinking, I don't know if I should raise my hand, just do it. You probably need it. Friends, I'm going to be praying for you. Thank you for doing that. I'll be praying for you all week. No, I will. I really do. I pray for you all every day. I really do. And then my other friends in the room, if you're like, Hannah, honestly, I haven't accepted that gift of salvation, but I think I want to. I'm curious. Talk to someone today. It's as simple as asking. Just saying, hey, Jesus, Hannah talked about this love, but I think you were talking to me. God, I love you and I want to follow you. Please forgive me. Just ask him. Just ask him. No greater love than this and he who lays down his life for his friends. So God, I love you. And I am so undeserving of the love that you've given me. And I hope in Jesus' name that I never lose the wonder of the love you have. So I pray in Jesus' name over these students, for the friends that said, Hannah, I I love God, but I forget he loves me. I pray that you would remind them, show them tangibly, maybe even today. If this wasn't enough, I pray you'd prove your love in a different way. And for my friends in the room that don't know you, I just pray that they would ask you, ask, hey God, I wanna follow you, I want that love. I pray that they would accept it. And God, I pray in Jesus' name, if people don't know you, that they'd come to know you. And then ask someone, ask me. I'm available. God, we love you. Thank you for your love that we do not deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, friends. Thank you for being here. And you guys are dismissed. Woohoo!